You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Deciding to side with the radicals is still an uncertain bet. But Hancock also saw the power of violent mobs. He saw the power of the people exerting themselves, especially in Boston, and he wanted to stay in their good graces. Hello, and welcome to episode 388 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Happy 4th of July. For years now, we've been creating special episodes to commemorate, celebrate, and remember the 4th of July. Many of our episodes have focused on the Declaration of Independence, how and why it was created, the ideas behind it, and its sacred words. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This year, I thought we'd examine a different aspect of the Declaration of Independence, the man behind the boldest signature on the document, John Hancock. Brooke Barbier is a public historian and holds a PhD in American history from Boston College. She's also the author of the first biography in many years about John Hancock. It's called King Hancock, the Radical Influence of a Moderate Founding Father. Now, as we investigate the life and work of John Hancock, Brooke reveals... How John Hancock became involved with the American Revolution and its politics and economics. The process behind John Hancock's decision to support the American Revolution and serve in various leadership roles in Boston, Massachusetts, and at the Second Continental Congress. And details about John Hancock's signature on the Declaration of Independence. But first, episode 400 is right around the corner, and we need your help to figure out how we should celebrate. What kind of episode would you like to hear for episode 400? We're asking this question of members of our listener community on Facebook. But if you're not on Facebook, you can still tell us what you think by sending me an email, liz at benfranklinsworld.com. That's liz at benfranklinsworld.com to share your ideas on how we should mark episode 400. Or you can tell us what you think in the listener community on Facebook. Okay. Are you ready to go behind the scenes of the most famous signature on the Declaration of Independence? Let's go meet our guest historian. Joining us is a public historian who received her Ph.D. in American history from Boston College. And she has worked as a lecturer at Boston College and Stonehill College in Massachusetts. She's the founder of Ye Old Tavern Tours, which offers tours of Boston's historic sites and taverns. Her research focuses on Boston's social and cultural life during the American Revolution. And she's the author of King Hancock, The Radical Influence of a Moderate Founding Father. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Brooke Barbier. Thanks so much for having me, Liz. As a longtime listener of the podcast, it's such a thrill to be on it. Well, we're really excited to have you on the show, Brooke, to talk about John Hancock. Now, as an active listener, Brooke, you may know that last year we were talking about Hancock's on-again, off-again friend, Samuel Adams. So I think it really will be great to have this conversation about John Hancock. So, Brooke, you've written a biography of John Hancock. It's called King Hancock. And it's really the first biography that I can think of that has been written about Hancock in such a long time. So would you tell us how you came to write a biography of John Hancock and why you titled it King Hancock, because if we think about John Hancock, many of us will remember his very large signature on the Declaration of Independence, basically doing away with kings and what is now the United States. I loved the title of King Hancock because it was a nickname that Hancock had. It's an intentionally provocative title because this is a revolutionary who ultimately separated from the British Empire and the crown. But it was a nickname that he had both used as an insult and in a positive way. When we first hear it is in 1774, British officers have arrived in Boston and they held captive a man demanding to know from him who ordered the destruction of the tea. When this man said 
Nobody. The officer shouted at him, you're a damned liar. It was King Hancock and the damned Sons of Liberty. Now, this nickname is really clever because it captures Hancock's enormous popularity in town, but it also serves as an insult that the best the colonists can do for their monarch is this guy, John Hancock, while they have the real monarch, King George III. But then something extraordinary happens, and that happens on April 19th, 1775. Many of our listeners will know that that day is the day the Revolutionary War began in Lexington and Concord. And as the British were retreating out of Concord that afternoon, they were being fired on by colonists. That's bad enough. Worse, they couldn't see where the colonists were firing from. They were firing from inside homes and behind walls and trees. And then even worse than that, a British officer recalled that as the colonists were retreating out of Concord back to Boston, they heard the colonists firing on them cry out, King Hancock forever. So this nickname had been appropriated. It had been an insult when used by British officers and a literal rallying cry on the day the Revolutionary War began. Such was Hancock's appeal. That's a really interesting story. And I will say that one of the things that fascinates me about April 19 is that we learned, thanks to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that Paul Revere goes out into the countryside to shout the British are coming, which is something Paul Revere never would have said because they're all British at this point. He's British. He would have shouted the regulars are coming or the redcoats are coming or if he wanted to be profane, he would have said the lobster backs are coming. But Revere wasn't just out to warn the countryside that the regulars were coming and marching from Boston. He was also writing to warn John Hancock and Samuel Adams, who were staying out in Lexington, that they had to go because the British have left Boston. And part of their mission is to capture these two revolutionaries. Yeah, that's right. And that's one of my favorite scenes in the book. And one of my favorite memories of Hancock, because Hancock is so unfazed when Revere arrives to the house, the Hancock Clark house, which still stands today. Revere arrives and says the regulars are coming and he's being shushed by the guards in front of the Hancock Clark house. And Hancock hears this disturbance and leans out the window and says, come in, Revere. We're not afraid of you. And Revere comes in to say, get out, get out of the house, get out of Lexington. And Hancock takes out his sword, thinking he's going to take on the British soldiers himself. And then he and Adams ultimately flee. And later that morning, Hancock is concerned with his salmon that he left at the house in Lexington. So it's this major moment that is an understatement. It is a pivotal moment in the colonial history and then future United States history. And Hancock is so unfazed and continues to just be having a morning, just a more difficult morning than he expected. Well, let's dig in into how John Hancock became involved with the American Revolution so we can even better understand these stories that we're talking about. So, Brooke, you wrote a biography of Hancock, and we know that biographies are designed to start at the beginning of someone's life. So let's start there. Would you tell us what we need to know about John Hancock's childhood and early life? Yes, and it's not much. Hancock was the third John Hancock. His father and grandfather, also John Hancock's, were ministers. And so it would seem that the firstborn son, John Hancock, would also become a minister. But his life changes. He had been living in Braintree, Massachusetts as a kid where his father had a parish. But his life changes when he's seven and his dad dies suddenly. And he is adopted by his wealthy paternal uncle, Uncle Thomas, a man who lives in Boston and who had a thriving merchant business. So we see a boy lose his father, be separated from his mother and siblings, and go to live as the only child with this shrewd businessman in the third largest city in the colonies. It would be such a culture shock for young Johnny, as he was called. He went to the finest schools, including Boston Latin School and Harvard, and then took on sort of an apprenticeship with his uncle, with the business being called the House of Hancock. And then at some point, Uncle Thomas formally announces that John Hancock is his partner. John Hancock gets some on-the-job training. He goes over to London for the first and only time when he's a young man. And he 
isn't artful or elegant with his business transactions. He's really learning a lot through failing, I'd say, in those early years. And then everything changes again. In 1764, Uncle Thomas dies. And while the house and its property goes to Aunt Lydia, Thomas's wife, all of the business and real estate holdings go to John Hancock. So he is 27 years old and he becomes one of the richest men in Boston. But Liz, the other thing to know is the year that Uncle Thomas dies, 1764, is the year we see the first tax being passed by Parliament, popularly known as the Sugar Act. And Hancock, all of the sudden, is thrust into political contention and economic strife, all without any sort of mentor. Hancock's training as a merchant sounds very similar to the training that other early American merchants received. Often, if you did come from a wealthy mercantile house, like John Hancock was coming from Uncle Thomas's mercantile house, your relatives would send you to the Caribbean or to London or to some other big European city so that you could help the company with trade, but also make trade contacts and network with other traders in these cities for when you came back to the colonies and had to conduct business. And in the case of those merchants who lived in Albany, where they traded a lot with the Haudenosaunee people, people like the Schuyler family or the Kyler family would send their relatives out to live with the Haudenosaunee for a summer or a year so that they could really get to know Haudenosaunee customs to make better trade with those peoples. So it sounds like John Hancock's education, he had developed this academic standing, right? He went to Boston Latin School. He went to Harvard at a time when basically no one went to college. And then he also had this very hands-on practical training to add to his academic training of apprenticing with his uncle and being sent to London so that he can learn this trade. Yeah, and I'd say the book smarts don't translate to the business smarts because in Harvard, they're teaching you how to write lectures oftentimes or to make legal arguments. And Hancock, that's not what he's going to set out to do. So I think this is why he fumbles around pretty early on is he is named partner in a business simply because he's the nephew of the owner. He doesn't have the training. He doesn't have that natural insight or that shrewd business ability that his uncle had. It takes a lot. And you know this well for Benjamin Franklin, too. It takes a lot to rise above your station so much and to amass such a large fortune. And Thomas did that in his single lifetime. And Hancock just didn't have that same ability. Now, what did Hancock do in 1764 when he's just inherited his Uncle Thomas's lucrative trade business and Parliament passes the Sugar Act and then in 1765 passes the Stamp Act? And we should note that Parliament was taxing first sugar, a good that the House of Hancock was either trading or might trade in. And then they went to tax all sorts of paper goods with the Stamp Act, including documents that traders like Hancock needed to get their ships in and out of port. So you couldn't trade unless you paid stamps on these trading documents. This is when we start the Stamp Act in 1765. We start to see him finding his way in how he's going to argue against this. So initially, he says, we must submit to this tax. And then when he realizes that this is very unpopular, so much so that men in Boston are violently rebelling against both the Stamp Act collector, Andrew Oliver, and the lieutenant governor, Thomas Hutchinson, you see Hancock change his tune. And he starts to say, you're going to hurt our trade. So he goes from a, we must submit to an economic argument. He writes to his fellow business partners in London saying, you have to lobby for us to Parliament because we won't survive this Stamp Act. And then even later, he adapts his mentality again, and he starts making constitutional arguments, saying this isn't constitutional to tax us. So we see an evolution with the Stamp Act. He goes through fits and starts of finding his voice and finding his arguments. But I'd say the most powerful one for him is the economic effect that the Stamp Act would have. And unlike those who comprised the violent mobs who targeted Oliver and Hutchinson, 
Hancock has an advantage because he has these contacts in London. He does have a voice that people listen to. He has a prominent trading house. So ultimately, it is the effort of Hancock and many other merchants who successfully lobby the merchants in London to lobby the parliamentary members and the Stamp Act is repealed. We see Hancock start to step into the power that he has. Everyone came to the American Revolution, those who supported it, for their own reasons. And it's really interesting how John Hancock came to the American Revolution because it seems like his support for the revolution was almost situational. So I wonder if you could tell us even more about how John Hancock became involved in the revolution. Because we've all heard and read historians who say, oh, the revolution was an economic movement. Others who said, no, it's a political and intellectual movement where the revolution was all about book smarts that Hancock and his peers acquired while reading law, history and philosophy at places like Harvard. And still there are other scholars that say, no, no, no. The American Revolution was really a social movement. It was about social mobility and increasing access to economic and political power and fixing the problems in American society that Great Britain just couldn't fix because Americans felt that the British imperial government was just too far removed from North America to completely understand the problems that early Americans faced. So there's a lot of different reasons why the revolution happened, and it's always fascinating to find out how certain people became revolutionaries. So would you tell us more about Hancock's revolutionary journey? Hancock gets involved, as I said with the Stamp Act, but you see it continuing in fits and starts. He goes in on the rebellion and then he comes out on the rebellion. After the Stamp Act is repealed, Hancock resumes business. And I think this is one thing that I had to relearn a lot, which is that Just because there was a tax passed, let's say the Stamp Act in 1765, that didn't mean that colonists suddenly said, we want to separate from the British Empire. That's it. One errant tax and we're out of here. Hancock was proud to be a member of the British Empire, and it's understandable why. His uncle had made a fortune under the British Empire. Hancock had a nice life under the British Empire. so. While someone like Samuel Adams continues to see political threats that may or may not exist, Hancock is happy to go about his business. And it's not until another tax or other violent mobs catch his attention that he re-engages. I wonder if we could also talk about John Hancock's role in the revolution as far as smuggling is concerned. Because John Hancock's name comes up early and often when you look at the history of smuggling. And Great Britain was bringing up his name as a really big smuggler. So we know that during the Townsend duties in the 1770s that Great Britain really tried to crack down on smugglers like John Hancock so that it could raise the revenue it needed to keep the 10,000 soldiers it had stationed at the frontier outposts after the Seven Years' War at those outposts. It wanted to protect the colonists and its imperial holdings in North America. So Brooke, Could you tell us more about John Hancock's smuggling and tax evasion during the early 1770s and how that impacted his ideas about the American Revolution? Smuggling was so prevalent in colonial America, but especially in Boston, that when the Sugar Act is passed in 1764, there's also other regulations put in place to try and curb smuggling. So we see it as early as 1764, that Parliament wants to crack down on smuggling. But in 1767, when they passed the Townshend Duties, they also establish a new customs board in Boston because they say we need to put some heft behind these taxes and actually collect them. And you can see that in some ways from the letters that customs officials wrote, that it's almost personal that they want to stop the smuggling in Boston because they complain that Boston has this very permissive attitude toward it. And there would be no bigger target to get than John Hancock, one of the most popular merchants. We can talk about it, but it's one of the moments that Hancock emerges unequivocally as a town leader and in some ways as a town hero. And that's when he smuggles in wine into Boston. Yeah, 
let's talk about smuggling, especially as we think of Boston as a city that smuggled plenty of tea, but not necessarily wine. Hancock was a lover of Madeira wine, which is a fortified wine from an island of the same name. And it was subjected to higher taxes, but he could afford it. And so it was something he loved. And in June 1768, one of his ships docks in Boston and the captain declares that there's 25 casks of Madeira on board and he pays the customs duties and they go their separate ways, the customs official and the captain, that is. But then the tidesman, that is the customs official, was named Thomas Kirk. He gets questioned saying there's no way that Hancock's ship called Liberty, there's no way that Liberty only had 25 casks of Madeira on board. It has such a larger capacity. You got lied to. And Kirk defended it, then said, no, everything was on the level. And then a month later, Kirk comes forward and changes his story, saying, not only was I not telling the truth, I wasn't telling the truth because I was afraid. And I was afraid because John Hancock's captain, called John Marshall, was scary. But John Marshall had recently died. And so Kirk said, "Okay, now I'm going to come forward and tell the true story. And he spins this whole account of how John Marshall asked Kirk to look the other way while they smuggled. And Kirk said that when he refused, he was locked into a cabin with the top nailed shut. And for three hours, Kirk could hear the noise of the tackles and the hoisting of goods. And then the noise stops. And Marshall opens the cabin's doorway and tells Kirk that if he breathes a word about what he saw or heard that night, he and his property would be harmed. Now, this story is the work of an imaginative mind, Liz, but it does what it needed. It gives customs officials that excuse to go target Hancock. And they go down to Hancock's wharf and seize that ship called Liberty. The irony is not lost here that they seize Hancock's Liberty. They brand the mast with the king's mark and then haul it out to Boston Harbor. And the townspeople erupt. They had warned those customs officials. Don't seize Hancock's ship unless you want to be chucked into the harbor. And the customs commissioners either weren't afraid of that or were so determined that after seizing Hancock's ship, the townspeople beat down those customs officials. And eventually, and this is really wild, they dragged one of the customs commissioner's boats out of Boston Harbor. They hauled it through the streets of Boston up to Boston Common, where they set the boat on fire. So this was a stunning display by the town to defend Hancock's right to smuggle wine. And it shows how popular he was in Boston. And we should say that boats aren't as easy to get in and out of the water in the 18th century when you don't have a pickup truck and a trailer where you can just back the trailer into the water and then pull the boat out. They're actually pretty difficult to get out of the water. (laughs) The royal governor, Governor Bernard, said there was about 500 to 1,000 men and that they were fueled by rum. So they had some liquid strength coursing through their veins. So it sounds like at this point, Hancock went from being involved in the revolutionary cause and being upset with all of this parliamentary taxation to really taking on a role as a community leader in Boston's revolutionary movement and activities. And Brooke, you mentioned that the Liberty incident played a role in Hancock's leadership. So I wonder if you would tell us more about how John Hancock became a leader of Boston's revolutionary movement. We see him really grow his profile with the Liberty Riot. And the Liberty Riot grew his profile in good ways and bad. It grew it nationally among the colonies, but it also grew it in London. The officials in London started to realize this was a man who garnered a lot of popularity. Hancock goes along with the non-importation agreement in Boston that begins in 1769, and he's one of the leaders. And then when most of the Townshend duties are lifted in 1770, Hancock goes back to being a merchant. We know that after the Boston Massacre, there was a lot of calm that descends not just in Boston, but throughout the colonies. And for three years, Hancock goes back to resuming his business. He goes back to enjoying himself, taking vacations, having parties. And it's not until the Tea Act that he re-engages. So this is where I say he's in on the resistance and then he's out. For a few years, he was happy to trade with the British Empire. He was happy to not worry about any threats 
like now that the crown was going to pay the judges salaries. That was something that happened in 1772 when Samuel Adams was furious about this, whereas John Hancock just didn't care much. But it takes the Tea Act to reignite him. The Tea Act was passed in 1773, and Hancock was such a large importer of tea in the years leading up to the Tea Act that this would significantly affect his business because now he wouldn't be able to sell the tea. It was just the designated tea consignees who could. And not surprisingly, Hancock hadn't been named one of them. So the Tea Act reactivates him and he becomes a supporter of the Boston Tea Party even speaking to the crowd moments before they went down to Griffin's Wharf to dump the tea overboard. But then Hancock shows himself again to pull back. So during that winter after the tea party, he really retires to his home. He emerges again in 1774. He was asked to lead the Boston Massacre Oration. This was a high honor, very high visibility, and he gives a stirring speech. But just a couple of weeks later, He gets in a fight with Samuel Adams because Adams doesn't want Hancock to attend the funeral of a royal official who had just died. And Hancock does attend, saying that I'm honoring the position, not the man himself. And so this is where even as late as 1774, we see him figuring out what might work best for him. And then when the Provincial Congress begins meeting, He doesn't join. He doesn't attend the First Continental Congress. And it's only later that he decides to join the Provincial Congress and he is named its president. And that is a significant move, Liz, because the Provincial Congress is essentially an illegal rogue government that is now declaring that they have the authority in Massachusetts to raise militia, collect arms. And Hancock's the president. So Hancock goes from even just a few months earlier being less than radical. He's certainly disappointing Samuel Adams by not going all in on the cause to being the president of an illegal government. So the big takeaway from all of what I just said is that he goes in and then he comes out and you can even if we don't have the letters from him or a diary to talk about why he's making these choices, you can see that he's trying to weigh his options, that in some ways the radicals, he finds them very tiresome. And then he decides ultimately, okay, I'm going to go in. It's safer for me to go join the Provincial Congress than for me to stay sympathetic to any Crown officials. Through the different choices that John Hancock made, we can really see someone who seems to have struggled with trying to figure out whether they wanted to go down the road of being a revolutionary and really standing up to the British crown to fight for their rights versus remaining on that path of loyal subjecthood where we'd already said John Hancock made a lot of money as a merchant by trading within the British Empire. And this is a process that we know happened, but it was so personal we can't always see or read about it in our history books about the revolution. Nor is this a process that we normally think about in relation to John Hancock. We think of him as this steadfast, radical Boston revolutionary from the get-go. But John Hancock seems to have really come to a decision after only wrestling with what he believed would be the best course of action. That's right. And that's one of the things that interests me most about him, is that you see how very human he is that his decisions, we sort of act if we see Samuel Adams' radicalism, it's only because independence was declared in the United States, ultimately won and became a sovereign nation that has grown in success and population and size since then, that you can say, oh, Samuel Adams was right all along. But that's only looking back with the benefit of hindsight. Those who were living through it didn't know what was going to happen next. And even the radicals didn't necessarily have some grand plan. I write in the book that psychologists identify a tendency called hindsight bias, wherein past events seem predictable or logical, and that when looking back, it's easy to think that there was never any other alternative or that it happened exactly the way that it should have. 
And I think hindsight bias is really easy to succumb to when we look at the American Revolution because it was ultimately considered a success. But for those living through it, they didn't know which side might win. So Hancock shows that side of it. He is really trying to find his way. He illustrates that, but he also illustrates, we don't always talk about this, although I think it's beginning to be studied by historians more, and I hope it will be, that group of about 40% of people who could be called disaffected, neutral, ambivalent, any number of things, and they were disaffected, neutral, ambivalent for their own reasons. But we tend to think of the American Revolution as this inevitable march towards the Declaration of Independence and then national unity. But in fact, it was so messy. And Hancock shows us that. He shows us that he goes in on the Sugar Act. He opposes the Sugar Act. But then he backs out and isn't that much bothered. And then he goes in on the Townshend duties. But then he comes out and begins trading and enriching himself with the British Empire. So he shows somebody finding their way. And that really interests me. It also seems like John Hancock shows us the economic side of the revolution's causes, where if you look at other revolutionary figures like John or Samuel Adams or James Otis, they really saw the causes of the revolution as being much more about the law and the amount of power parliament could wield over the colonies and really these ideological debates that some Americans had about constitutionalism and enlightenment philosophies about the role of government in people's lives. But I didn't get that sense from your book, King Hancock, that John Hancock was driven by these ideological and constitutional arguments and ideas as much as he was driven by how parliamentary taxation impacted his pocketbook. Certainly not driven by ideology. He was driven by pocketbook, definitely. You can see that so clearly. He was also driven by a desire to stay popular and stay safe. His pocketbook had benefited from the British Empire. So again, deciding to side with the radicals is still an uncertain bet because some of the wealthy, at least in Massachusetts, remained loyalists. They knew that they had benefited economically from the British Empire. So Hancock was taking a chance there. But Hancock also saw the power of violent mobs. He saw the power of the people exerting themselves, especially in Boston, and he wanted to stay in their good graces. He really liked to be liked. So when he sees that this is the way that this movement is going and that these people love him, they want him to be their leader, I think that would be very appealing as well to someone. It certainly was to Hancock. I know we're curious to hear more about John Hancock's popularity and how he grew it to rise through the leadership ranks of the revolution. But first, we need to take a moment. As we get ready to commemorate, celebrate, and reflect on the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence and the American Revolution, we should remember that we're part of a longer tradition of marking these historic occasions. For example, 200 years ago, Americans prepared to commemorate 50 years of American independence and democracy. As part of their commemoration, They invited the Marquis de Lafayette, the hero of two worlds, to return to the United States to help them mark the occasion. On August 16, 1824, Lafayette arrived in New York Harbor and disembarked to a crowd of more than 80,000 Americans lining the streets of Manhattan. Lafayette's landing in New York marked the start of a 13-month tour of the United States, which at the time consisted of 24 states. Now, none of us were alive 200 years ago to witness this grand event and celebration but we can witness a recreation of parts of Lafayette's Grand Tour in 2024 and 2025. On August 16, 2024, in honor of the 200th anniversary of Lafayette's Grand Tour of the United States, the American Friends of Lafayette organization will kick off a recreation of Lafayette's return to the United States. To learn more about Lafayette 200 and how and where you can attend one of its events, visit benfranklinsworld.com slash Lafayette 200. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash Lafayette 200. Brooke, how did John Hancock become popular and grow his popularity? Because he does seem to be a man of the people or at least a man for the people. And as you said, he really liked to be liked. So would you tell us more about John Hancock's ability to connect with his fellow Bostonians and with the population of greater Massachusetts? Massachusetts. 
Hancock is such a contradiction. He is a man of contradictions because he is this elite status. He looks elite. He looks wealthy. He looks different than everybody else with his powdered wig and gilded clothing and silk stockings. And yet he was so gifted at connecting with people. Account after account says this of him, that he was able to, one observer said, that the way he talked to somebody made you think that he was talking to, quote, a brother or relative. So he had a gift for connecting with people. He was a people person, if we use that modern term. And someone like John Adams, for example, simply wasn't a people person. He didn't have those social skills. And so Hancock made good use of them. One of the ways he did this was by throwing parties. He was generous with food and drink. When he was the colonel of the Corps of Cadets, which is Boston's militia group, he would host big parties. After the Stamp Act repeal, there was a big party that happened on Boston Common, and James Otis entertained people, and Hancock was entertaining people in his home, but he also gifted wine to the masses. He set up a big barrel of Madeira out in front of his house for people to enjoy, and he paid for a fireworks display that evening. And he mingled with the people outside. So we see him do things like that, meeting with people directly, inviting them into his home, that people got the feeling that he was on their side. It doesn't hurt when he stares down customs officials with that Liberty riot in 1768. And when he gives, for example, the Boston Massacre in 1774, the massacre oration, That helps him in Boston, but also, for example, that speech was printed as a pamphlet and distributed throughout the colonies. And so when people hear about him staring down customs officials in 1768 or this massacre oration in 74, that also starts to build his popularity because they see him in this leadership role. So John Hancock grows his popularity with these lavish parties, and everyone loves a good party, so I can really see how parties would help make John Hancock very popular. But it doesn't seem like he really grew this popularity on his own because behind the scenes of those giant parties would have been his enslaved people who worked to make those parties go off without a hitch and then cleaned up after those parties. So, Brooke, can you tell us about Hancock's experiences as an enslaver and whether his experiences impacted his thoughts about the revolution and its ideas of equality and freedom? And whether his experiences as an enslaver impacted his leadership of the revolution at all. Hancock's family benefited from slavery for decades, economically and politically. I write this in the book that when you see a picture of Hancock, it's typically by himself. It's this lone man. But if you or I were to be able to go back to 1774 in Boston and see Hancock, we would be surprised that he would likely have a black man right next to him. You would rarely see Hancock without a servant, whether paid later in his life or enslaved earlier in his life, right next to him. So his life depended on the enslaved people that were bequeathed to him. Uncle Thomas enslaved several men and women. And when he died, that property was bequeathed to Aunt Lydia. And when she died in 1776, she emancipated some of the enslaved people, but not all. And then those were bequeathed and passed down to John Hancock. And by the end of the 1770s, and unfortunately, we don't know why. In other words, we don't hear directly from Hancock. But at that point, he enslaves no men or women by the late 1770s. So his family had benefited for decades from the institution of slavery. And in his lifetime, Hancock emancipates them. This is likely for several reasons. Bottom-up emancipation, that is, people deciding that they were going to free the people that they enslaved, was starting to trend in Massachusetts. So we see Aunt Lydia doing this, for example, where some of them were manumitted in her will, and then some, there was conditional terms of their freedom, so You have to serve for another year and you have to be in good standing in that year and then you'll be emancipated. So we start to see the weakening of the institution of slavery within the Hancock family in the 1770s and then ending by the end of that decade. 
And then when the Massachusetts Constitution is ratified in 1780, it says that all men are created equal. And in Massachusetts, where Hancock is the first elected governor of Massachusetts, we see further weakening of the institution of slavery in the courts. Mumbet and Quack Walker both earn their freedom. And so Hancock is living in a place that is seeing the weakening of slavery. And like with most things, I think he made his decision based on what other people were doing. Now, by 1774, John Hancock's leadership role in the Boston Revolutionary Movement had turned into a colony-wide leadership role in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. And in May 1775, John Hancock joined the Second Continental Congress in Philadelphia, and that body elected him as its president as well. So, Brooke, it seems clear that Hancock was very popular in Massachusetts, But all of the actions that Massachusetts took to foment revolution, and by Massachusetts, I mean really Boston, all of the actions they took to foment revolution and stand up to parliamentary taxation wasn't always popular with the other 12 British North American colonies. So how did John Hancock, who hailed from what other colonies thought was a radical colony, get elected as president of the Second Continental Congress that represented all of the colonies? Hancock is chosen president of the Second Continental Congress precisely because he comes from the radical colony of Massachusetts and precisely because he's been a moderate in that colony of Massachusetts. So those that were nervous about the radicalism of Samuel Adams and John Adams with good reason knew that Hancock was different than that. Part of that is simply because they knew how wealthy he was. And so he was unlikely to act in a rash manner because he had a lot of financial interests to protect. Hancock getting the job of president, and he took it essentially from Peyton Randolph of Virginia. Peyton Randolph was president of the First Continental Congress and then the second, and he was called back to his home colony to legislate there. And that's not unusual that. Home colonies' interests were seen as more important than this Congress that some of the men in the colonies were taking part in. So we go from having a president from Virginia to the delegates looking north for a new leader. And Hancock being chosen president is the single most important moment of his life. And it's what seals his legacy to Americans today. He might pick a very different moment as being the most important in his life. But as a historian, that was the moment, the seemingly small, insignificant moment of Peyton Randolph leaving and Hancock taking over as president. That is what seals his fame, because a year after, it is only the president that needs to authorize the Declaration of Independence. And that is Hancock. And Americans today connect John Hancock and his signature on the Declaration of Independence So much so that a synonym for signature is John Hancock. And that was only possible because he became president. And what was John Hancock like as a president of the Second Continental Congress? Was he as moderate as everyone had hoped that he would be? Because he seems to have had great success in Massachusetts. But we know that not every politician could translate their local and colony-wide or statewide success into national politics. In fact, the same is true today. So How would you rate John Hancock as a national leader? And do you think his success in Massachusetts followed him as he led the Second Continental Congress? I would say Hancock as a leader was tireless. He worked himself so much with two sessions held twice a day. He sat on committees. As president, he was also responsible for a lot of correspondence. So he would write to General Washington. He worked tirelessly. After serving for nearly two and a half years, he said, I'm exhausted and I have to leave. He was proud of the efforts that the Continental Army was making, the strides they were making when he left. He was proud that the Articles of Confederation seemed near being ratified. And he considered that one of his personal successes for moderating those discussions. But it took its toll on him physically to have to work so exhaustively. And while he ultimately leaves office, he is, without knowing this, 
he is the longest serving president of the Second Continental Congress. And he doesn't know it also, but when he leaves as president, when he steps down, that will be the highest national office that he ever holds. Yeah, as you mentioned, John Hancock served as president of the Second Continental Congress from May 24, 1775 until October 31, 1777. And you also mentioned that Hancock's time in Congress took a real physical and probably even mental toll. Is that why John Hancock resigned from Congress to return to Massachusetts? Or were there other factors involved in causing him to resign? Part of it is because he was sick. He said he was so exhausted. But another reason is his wife had left Philadelphia to return home to Boston. They had recently lost their firstborn child, Lydia. And Dolly, his wife, didn't write back to him. When Hancock begged for letters and begged to hear how she was doing, he didn't hear back. And I think he got very, very homesick and was despondent about losing his daughter, not having his wife find any comfort in him. And while he was in Philadelphia as president, he went through three moves. The location of the Congress moved three different times. And I think he was worn out and felt he deserved a break. He goes back to Congress shortly after the break, but realizes, I don't want to do this if I'm not president, and returns home again. So he didn't know he'd be leaving Congress forever. He didn't know that he'd be stepping down from that national role, but he knew that he needed to tend to matters at home and take a break. After Congress, John Hancock became the first governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and later its third governor. But on October 8, 1793, John Hancock died at the age of 56. Rook, what do we know about the end of Hancock's life? Do we know why he died and why Boston threw him such a big funeral? Hancock's death, there's not much that we have in the historical record about. What we know is that shortly before he died, he wrote to Samuel Adams that he wished for a healthy mind in a healthy body. He knew his body was failing him. Why was it failing him? Well, he'd been suffering from gout for years. All of that Madeira and the rich foods that he could afford were taking a toll on his body, so much so that very late in his life, he often couldn't walk on his own. He had servants carrying him or he used a wheelchair. He couldn't hold a quill at certain points in his life. So he was ravaged by illness and succumbs in October when he's 56 years old. That is young to die. We tend to think sometimes of the life expectancy being very short for colonists, but Samuel Adams lived into his 80s and John Adams made it to 90. So it's not as if his contemporaries were dying in their mid-50s. Boston remembered Hancock with a massive funeral that I think would have surely delighted a man who loved attention. And there was a procession through Boston with Samuel Adams were there, John Adams were there, professors from Harvard, other lawmakers were there. And they went by meaningful spots from his life. And I think he would have really appreciated the thousands of people that lined the streets. They shut down all the shops in the afternoon so that people could attend the funeral. And he was buried in a mostly unremarkable grave in the Granary Burying Ground in downtown Boston. Today, however, if you were to go to the Granary Burying Ground, you see an obelisk with Hancock's face engraved on the top. And I think that would delight him too, but that didn't come around till another century after his life when Massachusetts decided to honor their first governor in that way. While you were researching your book, King Hancock, did you get a sense of how Hancock was remembered at the time of his death or how news of his death spread outside of Massachusetts? Part of Hancock's death was that it wouldn't have come as a surprise to most people. In 1787, 1788, as the constitutional ratifying conventions were taking place, there was some talk that Hancock might be named vice president or president of the new United States. Should the Constitution ratify, it would be Hancock who would serve in one of those two executive roles. And he was even promised that 
by Federalists in Massachusetts. And they went back on that. And ultimately, no one from Massachusetts voted for Hancock to be vice president. And of course, it was John Adams. But Liz, one of the reasons people gave for not electing John Hancock or not voting for him, rather, is of how sick he was. They said, we don't even know if he could finish out a term. He seems ready to go at any point. And so I think that illness hurt him politically. I know that it hurt him in the later stages of his life and would not have come as a surprise to people. Brooke, before we move into the time warp, I'd really like for us to discuss Hancock's legacy. So as we just mentioned, he died at the age of 56. And today we tend to remember John Hancock as the man with the obelisk grave marker in the Granary Burying Ground in Boston. And there are two buildings in Boston that have borne the name Hancock Tower, two skyscrapers, in fact. And there's even a Hancock skyscraper in Chicago. So John Hancock, for whatever reason, seems to be a man that we remember with skyscrapers. So would you tell us why we have Hancock skyscrapers and what you think his biggest and most lasting accomplishments actually were? How do you think we should remember John Hancock? The skyscrapers are named for the John Hancock Financial Company. It was an insurance company founded in the 19th century. And their logo was a stylized version of the John Hancock signature. And for a while, Liz, you know this, that it was over the center field scoreboard at Fenway Park as well. So John Hancock's name became synonymous with those buildings, even if the buildings, I think, both in Chicago and Boston, they've been bought out, but they're still known by locals as the John Hancock Towers. So they're named not for the man that we've just been talking about, but for a financial company that was named for the man we've been talking about. And I write in the book that I think Hancock, he would see this as a fair trade, that if he was remembered for nothing else but tall buildings and an elegant, bold signature, he would take that trade off because there are many men who toiled through these years and don't have the same popular memory among Americans. What I hope readers of the book and listeners of this episode take is that Hancock's signature on the Declaration of Independence, it was bold and audacious, but his politics were much less so. And he really serves as an example, as we talked about, about the uncertainty of the American Revolution. So while I would love to be able to make it black or white, that he should be known for this, what I'd like him to be known for in some ways is someone who was so very human during a very tumultuous time who sought out what was best for him and what was best for the people that he led. We should move into the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. So Brooke, we really have to know, in your opinion, Would we still remember John Hancock today if his signature on the Declaration of Independence had either not been on the document or not as large as it really is? Definitely not. Him signing the Declaration of Independence, him authorizing it, sealed his fame even at that time. Elbridge Gerry, who was no friend of Hancock's, a fellow Massachusetts politician, he was critical of Hancock all of the time. But he said that if Hancock supported the U.S. Constitution at the Massachusetts Ratifying Convention, that that would seal his fame because he also had his name tied to the Declaration of Independence. So even in his lifetime, contemporaries knew the significance of his name authorizing the Declaration of Independence. What we often don't think about, it's not until 1818 that Americans first see the signature of John Hancock on the Declaration of Independence. There was only one original copy with everyone's signatures on it, and there wasn't a copy of that made for the public until 1818. What they'd seen before was just the typeset name, the typeset Declaration of Independence with all of the words printed, and then at the bottom, 
It says John Hancock president. And then once people began seeing his actual signature and those of others, his fame really grows because people were so attracted to the signature. And that's when we begin to get that myth about him signing so big so that George III can see it. That's when his popularity continues to rise. So it's for that signature that he is remembered broadly by Americans today. Otherwise, he would be confined to being remembered by specialists. Now, a lot of historians are led to their next research projects because of the research they just conducted and just wrote up. So I wonder, is your next project involving John Hancock at all? Or has John Hancock pointed you to a new project? Somewhat. Boston history is my biggest interest, Boston's revolutionary history. And so for my next project, I'm zooming way out, which is different for me, and looking more at the American Revolution as a whole. John Hancock, of course, will be a part of that, but looking at others not like him, so Native peoples and Black women and men, as well as the people like Hancock. So I'm excited to step away from Boston history and look nationally. But Boston's history is just my ultimate favorite. When not writing, Brooke also runs a company called Yield Tavern Tours. And when people visit Boston, they have a lot of different tour options. Boston by Foot, for example, offers architectural tours. There are also chocolate and food tours. Brooke, you focus on tavern tours. So would you tell us about the tours you offer and how we might be able to take one of your tours? We would love to see Ben Franklin's World listeners on our tour. They're a lot of fun. Because we walk along the Freedom Trail in Boston, which is a red brick trail that links up several historic sites from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And so we see historic sites, including the site of the Boston Massacre and the grave of John Hancock. But we also stop in three historic taverns along the way to have a beer or cider. And we didn't really get into this today, but taverns were essential to the social and cultural fabric of 18th century life, especially in Boston. Hancock spent so much time in taverns. This is also where he built influence. So you're being historic and revolutionary by coming into a tavern with us. And we talk about the role that alcohol played in Boston's history and the American Revolution. It's a lot of fun. Do you stop where the molasses flood happened in the 19th century in the North End? We don't go that far. We see some quirky aspects of Boston's history that you might miss otherwise. Okay, I just needed to know how far your alcohol tours of Boston go. Brooke, if we have more questions about John Hancock and Boston during the American Revolution, where is the best place for us to reach you? I have a website, brooke-barbier, and someone could submit a question there. And we'd love to see you on a tour also. And that's at yieldtaverntours.com. And I really just want to thank the listeners for their interest in John Hancock. And Liz, it's such a thrill that I got to speak with you today. Well, Brooke Barbier, thank you so much for joining us and for taking us through John Hancock's life, his many accomplishments, and for showing us what John Hancock was like as a real human being. Thank you. I've loved it. It's easy for us to think that all of the United States' founding fathers were steadfast and enthusiastic revolutionaries right from the start of the American Revolution. But our conversation with Brooke revealed that many founding fathers and mothers had to work their way to a revolutionary position. The reality of British North America in the early to mid-1760s was that early Americans were prospering as Britons and as members of the British Empire. Great Britain was fresh off a major victory in the Seven Years' War, which put a lot of money into the pockets of early Americans. Now, sure, merchants like Thomas Hancock made a fortune by supplying military units in North America. But everyday farmers and tradesmen also did well, generally speaking. It really wasn't until the mid to late 1760s that early Americans started to see the economic depression or recession that came from switching a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. And even then, this economic downturn tended to hit cities harder than those in the countryside. It was within this deteriorating urban economic situation that Great Britain started to pass taxation measures to pay for its soldiers that it was stationing in outposts at Pittsburgh, Detroit, Montreal, Quebec, and St. Augustine, all to protect the new territories that the empire had won during the Seven Years' War. Now, men of wealth like John Hancock should have been able to weather these taxes. But everyday men who relied on stamp goods could not afford these new taxes. Plus, 
there were these learned men in history and law that argued that Americans shouldn't accept these new taxes because they weren't truly represented in Parliament. But John Hancock wasn't really one of those men. Sure, he was an educated man thanks to his Uncle Thomas, but he was primarily a trader and his business really flourished within the British Empire. So as Brooke showed us, John Hancock was less than enthusiastic about the American Revolution in its very early days. Brooke also helped us see that John Hancock always had an on-again, off-again relationship with the American Revolution and that most of his decisions about the movement were influenced by his checkbook. It was only in the aftermath of the Boston Tea Party during the Coercive Acts in 1774 that John Hancock finally decided to become a revolutionary and a revolutionary leader. Now, as a leader, John Hancock seems to have worked tirelessly. Serving on any of the Congresses held in revolutionary America was no joke. Congressmen worked really long hours, they served on many committees, and it often fell to a handful of the people on those committees to get the real work done. Now, as president of the Second Continental Congress, John Hancock had to read and correspond to all the committee reports, plus the reports, needs, and letters of the individual colonies turned states, the Continental Army, traders and representatives abroad, and everyday Americans who petitioned for help. The amount of work that John Hancock handled for two and a half years broke his health, and it led to his early death at 56. Now, a bright spot in Hancock's work is that he had the sole responsibility of authorizing the Declaration of Independence. He had to authorize the declaration so that men like John Dunlap and women like Mary Catherine Goddard of Baltimore or Clementina Rhine of Williamsburg could print and share the Declaration of Independence with the American people and with foreign nations. So John Hancock boldly signed the Declaration of Independence, and with his signature, Hancock wrote himself into United States history and into our historical memories of the American Revolution and our nation's independence. Look for more information about Brooke her book, King Hancock, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 388. Friends tell friends about their favorite podcasts, so please tell your friends and family about Ben Franklin's World. Seriously, telling others is the best way for us to find new listeners. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. Jordan Hammond, Ashley Bocknight, and Morgan McCullough. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what other stories of independence, the 4th of July, or the Declaration of Independence would you like to explore? Let me know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg, Innovation Studios.